Okay, let's take a look at Shang Dynasty China. This is going to be one of two dynasties that we explore for our early civilizations on ancient China. All right, we're going to work with the eight characteristics of civilization again. In this case, we're going to start off with urbanized society. What we know about the Shang is that they, they basically built their cities of wood, uh, usually in a forested area. Uh, they actually had a centralized capital, and the capital's name was Anyang, so that's the best example. Of course, much of this uh, architecture and these buildings don't exist anymore since the Chinese made most of these uh, early cities out of wood. So it's hard to know whether they actually looked in this manner or not. Uh, but essentially, they had their cities, and their cities were usually located along river valleys, in this case, the Yellow River Valley. They also had well-organized central government. It was ruled by a king and supported by a noble warrior class who owned the land. So in ca many cases, the king would actually grant land grants to the nobles or to soldiers in exchange for their loyalty to uh, him as king. These nobles, again, paid tribute to the king, which means they used their land to produce agricultural goods in most cases, maybe collected it as taxes from the peasants, but then would redistribute it uh, to the king. So they would actually pay tribute to the king. In exchange for paying that tribute, the king allowed them to keep the land. Uh, this is very much like feudalism, and in many cases, the, this is considered to be China's feudal period. Okay, they also had complex religions, and most important component of their religious beliefs was family. Family was really important. They also believed in ancestor worship, and ancestor worship is the idea that um, your dead ancestors basically were spirits. They believed that you had to respect the spirits, uh, of dead relatives. So in many respects, they, they sort of believed in ghosts. Uh, if you've ever seen shows like you know, Mulan, you know that ghosts play an important role in the lives of the characters in that story. Uh, but that's true in China, that they actually believe that their dead ancestors, their spirits, are still around and need to be taken care of, just like you would take care of a living relative. They also believed in the idea of Shangdi. And Shangdi was originally conceived of as sort of a supreme god. But this idea of monotheism never really took hold in China. In fact, Shangdi is also the same term that would ultimately become the reference to the emperor, the emperor being sort of a father figure to the people. So their religious beliefs sort of changed over time. But the one thing that did not was the concept of family being important and family ancestral worship. Uh, and of course, the Chinese concept of heaven was really just uh, very different than the concept of heaven in the Western world. Heaven for them is really just a recreation of the bureaucratic system that existed on Earth. So in many ways, the you know, well-organized centralized government was also part of their belief system. Okay, public works. They had elaborate irrigation systems. In particular, they built levees for flood control. The idea is if you built dikes and levees and barriers along the rivers, you could prevent those rivers from flooding and you could therefore control the uh, production of uh, agriculture by being able to irrigate their surrounding countryside. Of course, that leads to some problems in some places, especially along the Yellow River, where the riverbed is actually higher than the surrounding countryside over time. They also built massive earthen walls. And so the Chinese around almost every one of their cities built walls. And even today, the Chinese still have lots of walls. Although modern China is in the process of tearing down a lot of its walls, uh, Chinese cities are often characterized by walled compounds, walled houses, but also these walled cities that were designed to protect them. Okay, they also had a road network, and they traveled by cart. So in this picture here, you can see that the, the concept of a Chinese chariot or a cart was pretty simple, but it allowed them to transport goods and people uh, over great distances, and of course it had some military applications as well. But the maintenance of roads facilitated communication, travel, and trade. Okay, job specialization. Uh, there were large divisions between the ruling class and the peasantry. And so the examples are at the top of society, there would have been priests and scribes. Uh, there would have been warriors. There also would have been government workers because that well-organized central government was really important to the Chinese. In fact, they sort of invented the concept of a bureaucratic system of government. They've had the world's first system of government and the longest lasting system of government. Also, there were laborers and farmers at the bottom end of that spectrum. So really a big distinction between those at the top and those at the bottom. And that brings us to social class. You can see on the chart here, at the top would have been the ruling family, at the king, um, priests, government workers, and warriors. And then below that were essentially peasant farmers and slaves, which were the majority of the population. 
Now, it's going to be a little bit more complicated as we get into the Zhou Dynasty, uh, later on the Han Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty. Uh, but as we go through Chinese history, this class system will change dramatically. So this is really a reflection of what the feudal class structure might have looked like uh, during the Shang and maybe even in the Zhou Dynasty. Okay, we've also got art and architecture. Um, we know they built elaborate palaces and tombs. Um, the palaces, of course, don't exist anymore, but the tombs are oftentimes uh, discovered, and usually what's found in them are artifacts that are usually characteristic of the art that was being created at that time. So the houses that people lived in generally would have been timber-framed houses. Um, there are some sort of sketchings that are carved on stone or some paintings of them, but generally we don't have any, too many ideas of what their houses might have looked like. However, there are lots of bronze uh, artifacts that are discovered in the tombs. They might have been ritual vessels for religious reasons. Some of them were mirrors that were used that would have been shiny bronze that you could use as a mirror, and others were used as weapons. Uh, but these are often found in tombs. In addition to that, you find jade carvings. Jade was a very important mineral resource uh, to the nobles and to the king, uh, and to be able to uh, possess jade or possess any of these sort of bronze items uh, would have sort of uh, defined you as a very wealthy or well-connected or powerful person. Okay, they also had writing. Their writing was a pictographic language. Um, they used Chinese characters, and, and the Chinese characters they use today are a little bit different, but essentially the concept and the idea hasn't changed that much. Characters can have more than one meaning, so that's important that you understand that uh, if you look at a Chinese character, it, it's not like looking at English uh, word that's spelt out. It, it, a single word can have more than one meaning to it. Uh, and there are thousands of characters. Today, to be able to read a modern Chinese newspaper, you need to know anywhere between about 2,000, maybe 2,500 Chinese characters to be able to read a newspaper. Okay, so that's it. We're going to discuss writing in more detail um, in another screencast and also in class. But I want you to keep in mind that just like we've seen with Mesopotamia, uh, with uh, Egypt, and also the Indus Valley, the eight characteristics of civilization apply. So make sure you know what the eight characteristics are and be able to differentiate how China employed the eight characteristics with the other civilizations.